John Kane. I'm uh, one of the melanoma surgeons, and I wanted to kind of shift gears and talk about sentinel lymph node biopsy, which has been a huge change in how we stage and manage melanoma over the last couple of decades. But like many other things, I think it's important to know what it can and can't do, because at the end of the day, it's just a procedure. So why do we care about lymph nodes in cancer? And it, for those of you who do know me, I, I don't think we should just do things because we're supposed to do them. I think you should always ask yourself, why are we doing this? What's the benefit? What's the risk? Lymph nodes are part of the immune system. You've got thousands of them in your body. They drain every part of your body, the normal watery fluid. And basically their normal job is they're looking for infection. So the swollen glands that you get whenever you have a sore throat or your lymph nodes responding to the infection and going back to normal. So why do we care about them so much in cancer? Because they're not a vital organ. You can live without them. Uh, you can't live without all of them, but in an area you can live without most of them. Well, one of the reasons is what we learned, and this isn't just for melanoma, but this is for many cancers. If your melanoma can get to lymph nodes, there is a higher chance that you will develop distant spread. So it's very predictive of your risk of getting distant spread, which, which then does define survival. If the lymph nodes are involved, we can remo remove them and cure somebody. So lymph nodes in and of themselves are not incurable. That's why they're typically stage three and not stage four. And as you'll hear from Dr. Pujanov, it helps guide the insurance or the adjuvant therapy. So if somebody is high risk, can we do things to treat their whole body to improve their chances of being cured? So for many, many years for melanoma, if you wanted to know if your lymph nodes were positive, we would just take them all out. We'd remove all the lymph nodes in your groin, all the lymph nodes in your armpit. Same as for breast cancer. So from that standpoint, that was kind of the standard of care for staging. And if they were positive, they needed to come out and you weren't happy that you were stage three. If they were negative, you loved the good news that you got, that you had a better chance of being cured, but you might end up like this. So one of the consequences of removing all the lymph nodes is lymphedema. So you now have this congestion of the lymphatic fluid. It can't drain through because the lymph nodes are missing and it can be managed, but it can't be cured. So from a quality of life standpoint, having all of your lymph nodes removed wasn't really the best idea. So I would like to say I could take the credit for this idea, but as Dr. Ernstoff said, it was Dr. Morton um, at the John Wayne Cancer Center, Cancer Institute. He came up with a very interesting concept and, and think about it like a subway. So that's the DC subway. If, if I get on the, the red line in, you know, say Shady Grove, the first stop after I get on is always the same stop. You can't skip that and get on to the other line. You can't go two stops and things like that. So it's a very orderly progression and it's the same every day. And that's exactly the same for your lymph nodes. So for every part of the body, they drain through the same series of lymph nodes every single day. So just as Dr. Ernstoff said, the sentinel node is the sentry. If this tumor is going to spread to lymph nodes, it has to go to this one first before it can get to the rest of them. So if you wanted to know if the patient's cancer had learned how to spread to lymph nodes, you really only have to look at this one. You don't have to look at all of them. So this was a very simple concept, and I tell people it's a combined treasure map pregnancy test. So the treasure map is we're gonna use radioactive dye to tell us where to dig. So we're not just randomly guessing what lymph nodes we should take out. This will tell us exactly where to take them out. And then just like a pregnancy test, there's two answers. It's positive or negative. So we're gonna take out that lymph node and find out whether that person's melanoma has learned how to spread to lymph nodes or not. So the same day we're going to do all this surgery, the patient goes down to the nuclear medicine department and what you can't see, this was a melanoma on the left foot. They inject some radioactive dye. It gets taken up in the lymphatic tubes and this is a lymph node in the left groin. So you can see it lights up and becomes temporarily radioactive. I know I don't need to take lymph nodes out behind their knee or in the right groin because this tells me it's that lymph node in the left groin matches that piece of skin where the melanoma was. We then take the patient to the operating room and we use a little handheld Geiger counter and it lets us localize right where that radioactivity is. So what you can see here, that incision's barely more than an inch in size. So when taking them all out is from your lower abdomen to the middle of your thigh, we can go in and just take out the one or two radioactive lymph nodes and those are the ones that match that piece of skin. And then I send them to Dr. Bogner and he works his magic and about two weeks later we get an answer. Um, if you were listening closely, Dr. Ernstoff said that Dr. Bogner's lazy. So if I give him all the lymph nodes, he just cuts them in half. He goes, oh no, that one's negative. Oh no, that one's negative. But if I only give him one or two, he goes crazy and he slices up into multiple little slices. And just like Dr. Ernstoff had shown you, if you had just gone in the middle, this one would have been negative. But by doing the serial sectioning, 
you find out that it's positive. So now that melanoma patient would be stage three, even though we clinically couldn't feel that lymph node. Everything felt normal because we're literally talking about microscopic disease. So there was a huge debate in melanoma for a long time is if lymph nodes are associated with a higher risk of distant spread, what is the mechanism? So there were two camps. One of them was the incubator group and one of them was the predictor group. So in the incubator group, the thought was, what's well, going to go to your lymph nodes and it's going to grow. And if you don't do anything about it, it's going to get bigger and bigger. And then somehow it's going to spill over into your bloodstream and go to your distant organs. So if you could just catch it in the lymph nodes before it had a chance to get big and grow and go to other nodes, you could decrease the chances of it going to the distant organs. The other group was the predictor group and that it's the behavior, the ability for the melanoma to go to the lymph nodes suggests a higher chance of it being able to go right to the distant organs. And I'll come back to that. We kind of knew the answer all along, but we never really thought about it. So the incubator group is we're going to get that out of there really early and you'll have a better chance of being cured. The predictor group is more about behavior. So think about if your melanoma wants to be able to get to a lymph node, it has to fly there in a biplane. That is not a simple process. You can't just get in, turn it on and take off. So I'm not flying with anybody if they tell me they only know how the rudder works. You better know the rudder, the flaps, the instruments, the landing gear. So if the melanoma gets smart and it learns all those tricks and Dr. Bogner and Dr. Ernst have showed you these complicated pathways of mutations and the immune system being turned off and, hot and the melanoma hiding from it. So if the melanoma could learn all these tricks, it could get to the lymph node. Getting to the distant organs, think of it as being a little more complicated, flying a jet. So clearly, if you can't fly a biplane, you're probably not going to be able to fly a jet. If you can fly a biplane, you might be able to fly a jet. So we can't get to the distant organs. We don't have a blood test. The CAT scans, PET scans don't show you anything you know, smaller than almost a marble or even a large BB. So we're using the lymph nodes as the next best thing. If your lymph nodes are negative, your melanoma is still kind of stupid. It's a lower chance it learned how to get to the distant organs. If your lymph nodes are positive, it learns some tricks. It can fly the biplane. There's a higher chance it might have gone to your distant organs. And the reason I'd say we already knew that it was more the predictor model than the incubator model is how melanoma acts with age. We've known all along is when you're younger, you have a much higher chance of having lymph node spread. So you can say, see, for all but the thinnest melanomas, your risk of lymph nodes being positive when you have melanoma drops with every couple decades of life. But the risk of distance spread goes in the exact opposite direction. When you're young, you have a much lower chance of lymph node spread and are, are, when you're young, you have a much uh, lower chance of distance spread for your high risk of lymph node spread. When you're older, you have a much lower chance of lymph node spread and a high risk of distance spread. So clearly, if the incubator model was the correct model, the two things should be going in parallel, and they're actually moving in the opposite direction. So the million dollar question was, if we find your lymph node disease very early and remove it, can we increase the chances of curing you? So this was a huge multi-center, international, randomized prospective study, multiple institutions. We were one of the institutions that took many, many years. And it was actually very elegant in its simplicity. So there were over 2,000 patients. They looked at intermediate thickness melanomas and then thick high-risk melanomas. And basically, in not a complete 50-50 way, they flipped a coin. And if you had melanoma, we went and we did your wide excision, the potentially curative treatment. One group of people got a sentinel lymph node biopsy, and if it was positive, we went and took out all the rest of the lymph nodes in that area. Because again, for 50 years, the standard of care for having a positive lymph node was to go back and remove the rest of them. You might only be stage three, let's get all that lymph node disease out of there. The other group of people got a wide excision and didn't get a sentinel node biopsy. We just watched them. And over time, if their lymph nodes turned positive, we would go in and take them out. So one group was getting their lymph node disease found very early and having all of the lymph nodes removed, the other group was being watched. And what, was, what did we learn from this study? Well, the most important thing I think we learned is your sentinel lymph node is very predictive of your risk of distant disease or your prognosis. So it's an extremely valuable prognostic factor. You can see for intermediate thickness melanomas, about 85% of people, if they're negative, will be fine, whereas 62% of people, if they're positive. Even in thick melanomas where the risk just from the primary tumor is very high, there was still a difference. If you have a thick melanoma and your lymph nodes are negative, you're going to do better than a similar group of people with the same thickness and their lymph nodes are positive. And if you think about it like scissors, paper, rock, the lymph nodes almost trump the other factors. 
So you would rather have a two millimeter thick melanoma and have your lymph nodes be negative than a one millimeter thick melanoma and have your lymph nodes be positive. So extremely predictive. We can now sort people one more time and say, well, for the features of your melanoma, your lymph nodes are negative. You're gonna do much better than we would have predicted had we not looked at the lymph nodes. Or you're a little bit higher risk. We may need to think about doing some other things. What it didn't do was change survival. So this is melanoma specific survival. So this isn't the person died of a heart attack or old age or a car accident. This was the ch dying from their melanoma. And you can see in both the intermediate thickness groups and the, th the thick melanoma groups, the survival was exactly the same. So whether we got that lymph node disease out very early when it was positive or we waited and dealt with it later, you still had the same chance of being cured. What else did we learn from this study? What was interesting is by finding it early, most people only had one positive lymph node. In fact, many of the times it was just the sentinel node. When we took all the rest of the lymph nodes out, they were negative. So we did find it before it went to the second subway stop and the third subway stop and the fourth subway stop. And you can see actually in the patients who you watched them and waited till it showed up, you know, almost one in four or more than one in four would have at least four or more positive nodes. So if we were trying to get control of this lymph node disease, then finding it early would be a good thing, but it didn't seem to be changing survival. So this sentinel node came out in the early 90s. We started doing it at Roswell in 1996. And again, the standard of care was if you had a positive node, whether we could feel it or it was a sentinel node, we took the rest of them out, what's called a completion lymph node dissection. What you can see is starting in the late 90s, the number of people getting a completion node dissection for a positive sentinel node started to drop. In fact, by the mid-2000s, only half the people in the United States that had a positive sentinel node were getting the rest of the nodes removed. So the question was why? Were these all bad surgeons who didn't know the literature and weren't following the standard of care? But the reality was, is in parallel to all this stuff, we started learning more. You know, after a, a decade or two of doing sentinel node biopsies, we got smarter. And one of the things that we learned is we could predict the likelihood that the non-sentinel nodes, or the second and third stops on the subway, would be positive or negative. And, and the first part's a little bit busy, don't get too lost in the details. But what you can see is based upon the thickness of the primary tumor, how big the focus was in the sentinel node, the number of nodes we took out, we could say to some people, well, your risk of having additional positive nodes is zero. Like we got it all with the sentinel node biopsy or it's 40% or it's 60%. So we started to select out which people were unlikely to have additional positive nodes and spare them all the risks and the, the consequences that went with completion node dissection, all that lymphedema that we talked about. If you take out all the lymph nodes in somebody's armpit, about 20% of people will get chronic arm swelling. If you take out all the lymph nodes in their groin, about 25% of people will get chronic leg swelling. So we wanted to start to spare the patients the consequences of removing them all, doing the completion node dissection, if it wasn't going to help them. But one of the things that got lost, and I'm gonna come back to that, and it's very important because things in life come full circle. Save your ties, they'll be wide, they'll be narrow, and then they'll be wide again. So now that we have all these effective therapies, knowing more precise prognosis in stage three is becoming more important. If you had a positive non-sentinel node, you did much worse than if the second and third level nodes were negative. And so there's something biologically, again, if we talk about your tumor being smart versus stupid, if it was smart enough to get to the first node but wasn't smart enough to get to the next ones, you did better than if it was smart enough to get to the next one. So in a very George Orwell 1984 way, two doesn't equal two. You would rather have two positive sentinel nodes and have all the rest of the nodes we take out be negative than have one positive sentinel node take out the rest of them and have one other one be positive that person biologically is not gonna do as well. And if you're not taking out the rest of the lymph nodes, we're losing that information because we don't know which people at that point in time have additional positive non-sentinel nodes. So there was a smaller study to look at this very question, just like the first one, is doing sentinel node impacting survival? It would be, is doing a completion node dissection impacting survival? So the first study was a small German study and there were some criticisms, it's not a lot of people, it, the follow-up was very short. Um, they used very small amounts of nodal disease because they pre-screened people doing ultrasounds of the lymph nodes before they even did the sentinel node biopsy. But they looked at distant metastasis-free survival, which in this time frame, it, other than the last couple years, getting distant spread typically meant death. Um, it's really been in the last few years that Dr. Ernstoft and Dr. Pujanov have come up with these new treatments that let you live longer and even be cured in the setting of stage four. But if it went to your lungs, liver, or brain, most people were not cured of their melanoma back when all of this was being done. 
So if you look at the study, uh, distant metastasis-free survival is up here, which you could say is a surrogate for just being alive. This is overall survival. This is recurrence-free survival. No difference in the curves. So whether you got all the rest of your lymph nodes removed if you had a positive sentinel node, or we watched your lymph nodes and they did little ultrasounds and only took them out later if they turned positive and you were otherwise doing well, your chances of being cured was the same. They then said, well, maybe it's just because it's such a small amount of disease. So this curve is if the amount of disease in your sentinel node was less than a millimeter. This curve is if it was a bigger focus over a millimeter and the same thing, no difference in survival. The bigger study was being done at the same time. So one of the things that's interesting about clinical trials is it takes several years to develop the idea and get it implemented. It takes several years to get the patients on the trial, and then it takes several years to follow them and see what the outcome is, especially if it's something like survival and things like that. So a trial can be a decade or more, and if you always wait until you have the answer to the last one, you're never going to be asking the next question. So a lot of times these trials start when the last trial is still going. So the same people that did the MSLT1 um, did the MSLT2 trial, and it was the very question we asked. So you have melanoma, we do a sentinel node biopsy, it's positive. We're going to flip a coin, and we're either going to watch you and just check your lymph nodes with ultrasounds and only take them out if they turn positive, or we're going to take them all out now, which at that time would have actually been the standard of care. They did an interesting thing for people who, when Dr. Bogner looked at the node and it was negative, he didn't see even two or three abnormal tumor cells with the special melanoma stains, they would actually grind up the lymph node and look for molecular markers, what's called RT-PCR, and they included those patients in the study, which was a, another criticism because that's not the standard of care. We don't take people with negative lymph nodes and subject them to a node dissection just because there was some weird marker in there, you know, four or five markers for melanoma. But that was inclu included as part of the science in this study. And what you can see here, this is melanoma-specific survival, no difference. So whether we waited and only dealt with your positive lymph nodes later or whether we took them out now, you know, when you had your positive sentinel node, same chance of being cured. So then they asked, well, maybe it was just that weird RT-PCR group. So they separated them out, and you can see even by the standard looking at it under the microscope and seeing the melanoma in the sentinel node, the survival was the same. This is disease-free survival. So disease-free survival means coming back any place. It could be where it started, in the lymph nodes, in the distant organs. And there was a small but real difference in disease-free survival. But all of that was the lymph nodes. So this is nodal recurrence-free survival. So clearly, if you know on average 20% of people still have melanoma in the other lymph nodes, they're probably going to have it come back over the time that you follow them. This is distant disease-free survival, and there's no difference. So yes, if you don't get your lymph nodes removed now when you have a positive sentinel node, probably one in five people at some point we're going to have to go back and take out the rest of them when it shows up. But it's not impacting your chances of being cured in any way. Um, I think this is very interesting because a lot of patients wonder, you know, we give them this mumbo jumbo, we're going to follow you every three months for the first two years and then every six months till year five, once a year till year 10. Um, people wonder like, well, how come my friend had pancreas cancer and they only had five years of follow up? And the two parts of it is the risk of it coming back is front loaded. It is highest at the beginning and drops off over time and every cancer is different. So melanoma, people do recur sometimes seven, eight, nine years out. Pancreas cancer, if you're alive at five years, you're going to be cured. It doesn't come back seven, eight years later. So what you can see in the observation group is that mo these are the people who had a positive sentinel node and we're just watching them. The risk of the lymph nodes showing up was highest in this first couple years. You can see the curves going up, 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 up. And then it starts to level out, but it takes about 10 years to flatten out. So that's why you're being seen every three months. If the, 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 for distance spread and lymph node spread, the highest chances in those first couple years, and then the risk is gonna start going down over time. But there are events still happening seven, eight, 10 years later. You can also see that surgery wasn't perfect. And I'll come back to that, because that's gonna be, I think, one of the things we, that's gotten lost in all of this. So these people had all their lymph nodes removed, and this is the risk of it showing up in lymph nodes down the road. So although that curve is much flatter than the other curve, because those people didn't have surgery, there were still people who had all their lymph nodes removed and it was still showing up in the lymph nodes. And some of that is it's in the lymphatic tubes, as Dr. Ernstoff talked about, in transit disease. It, when we remove the lymph nodes for a node dissection, we're not removing the individual lymph nodes. We're just identifying all the things that stay and taking everything else out. And then Dr. Bogner and pathology are looking through to find all the lymph nodes that are in there. 
Another thing we learned from this study, so remember this is people who had a positive sentinel node, so we know they're all stage three. A lot of the previous prognostic factors, the sex of the patient, their age, the location, didn't really matter anymore. So once you're stage three, some of those things aren't so predictive. Some things still were, the thickness of your melanoma, whether it was ulcerated or not. So if you had a four millimeter thick melanoma and your nodes were positive, you didn't do as well as a one millimeter thick melanoma with positive lymph nodes. What disappeared was the number of lymph nodes, which we used to think was very important. You know, you'd rather have one positive than two, two positive than four. Once you had a positive central node in this study, that didn't seem to make a difference. What made a huge difference was positive non-sentinel nodes. So remember, this group didn't get the rest removed, so we don't know that they had positive non-sentinel nodes. If you had the rest of them removed and you had additional positive nodes, you were almost twice as likely to die from your melanoma as not. So when we're not doing the completion lymph node dissection, we're missing that extra piece of information. So I always think in life, you know, the saying, there's no free lunch. There's, a good, there's good things and bad things to progress and changes and new things that develop. So what have we gained in this 20 plus year journey? I think the most important thing is the status of the sentinel lymph node is very predictive of your melanoma survival. Uh, most people with cancer, their million dollar question is, how am I going to do? You know, they have to plan their life. Um, if we can sort them one more time and say, you're gonna do better than we thought based on the thickness of your melanoma and the ulceration, or you're gonna do a little worse, that helps them make some decisions, make some plans in life. But this drops off at the two extremes of age. And what I mean by that is if you're a younger person and you have positive lymph nodes, you still have a pretty good chance of being cured. The biology is different. So there are 20 year olds with positive lymph nodes that still only have a 20% chance of getting distant spread. On the flip side, if you're in your 80s or 90s and we do a sentinel node biopsy and it's negative, it's not so warm and fuzzy because we know that older patients tend to have negative lymph nodes but still have a higher risk of distance spread. So that prediction of positive is bad, negative is good kind of drops off at the two ends of everything. Most patients don't need a completion lymph node dissection for if they have a positive sentinel node biopsy. If you think about that lymphedema, having that for the rest of your life, if we can wait now and only remove the lymph nodes in the people that prove to us that they have other positive ones and they really need it to cure them, then if they get lymphedema, they can live with the consequences. So now we don't subject everybody just because one node was positive, you're going to lose them all. And I think probably the most important thing is there's now effective FDA approved adjuvant or insurance therapies for nodal metastatic melanoma. A few years ago when the person's sentinel node came back positive, we'd have a discussion, they'd say, okay, well, now you just told me I have a little higher chance of getting distance spread, what are we gonna do? We'll follow you closely. But now I say, oh no, you're gonna go visit medical oncology. You may go with immunotherapy, you may go with BRAF MEK inhibitors. So we have a way to sort of stack the deck in their favor and say this wasn't just about getting information, this was about getting information that we're gonna act upon and do something different to try to cure you. Well, what have we lost? So I think one of the things that's very important is that staging. If we're not taking out the rest of the nodes when somebody has a positive sentinel node, we don't know about that non-sentinel node status. So for somebody who's on the fence, maybe they've got a 30% chance of distance spread based on that one positive sentinel node, taking out the rest may actually give them the information they need to decide whether they're gonna pursue the adjuvant therapies or not. I would also say that we're going to quickly have a generation of surgeries who don't know how to do lymph node surgery for melanoma. So I've been in practice for almost 20 years. An axillary dissection for melanoma is very different than for breast cancer. A groin dissection is an operation we don't typically do for most other cancers. So for our surgical oncology trainees a few years ago, in the three months they would rotate with us, they might do 14 groin dissections and 15, 16 axillary dissections. I have fellows now in three months that are seeing two. And, and that's better for patients, but I always tell people, I, I have dysplastic neva, I have a lot of sun exposure in my life. If I get nodal metastatic melanoma, I, and, I, and I need to have them removed, I wanna find somebody who knows how to do it, and I can't do it on myself. It's kind of tricky with mirrors and being awake and stuff. So I think as a society, we have to address this. We don't wanna lose the ability to take care of people that need a certain type of surgery. And I think it's gonna complicate the design and interpretation of future clinical trials. <clears throat> all of the studies that Dr. is gonna to talk to you next about all these effective therapies were done in patients that we knew about all their lymph nodes. We knew their sentinel node was positive, we knew whether they had other positive nodes or not. So if Dr. Ernstoff comes up with an amazing new melanoma therapy, and we say it's for stage three disease, we flip a coin, 
and Sentinel node positive people, some of them get it, some don't, but we haven't taken out the rest of the nodes. What if by chance the group that got it just had lots of non-Sentinel nodes that were positive and they're just gonna do worse? We may lose the benefit of that treatment. We may say, oh, it didn't make any difference. They didn't do any better, but it was kind of skewed because we hadn't really gotten all of the information about each of those patients to sort them. So that doesn't mean that we should subject patients to no dissections just for that information and with the risk of lymphedema, but we do have to be thoughtful about what are we going to do moving forward if we're not having the complete picture. So in conclusion, I think sentinel lymph node biopsy provides very valuable prognostic information, but it's not changing survival. If you think about it like blackjack, I couldn't find a good blackjack slide that didn't look really weird when you go on the internet. There's an up card and a down card, and both cards decide your hand, whether you have a good hand or a bad hand. The, the biopsy of your melanoma is the up card. It tells you the Breslow thickness, the ulceration, that kind of stuff. The down card, we don't really have a way to look at it. It's the distance spread. In 2018, we don't have a test for microscopic disease in your lungs or liver but the sentinel node biopsy is the next best thing. So whether you let that card sit on the table face down forever, or you turn it over the second you get it, you still have the same hand. So all things being equal, you just kind of want to know what hand you have. By doing sentinel node biopsy, we can flip the card, but time isn't going to change it. So you would expect that it's not going to impact survival, whether you look at your lymph nodes now or deal with them later. And I would say there's costs and risks associated with sentinel node biopsy, and they're not just financial costs. It is general anesthesia. It does cost several thousand dollars. Um, almost all of the first world countries do it except the UK. They feel that it's a lot of money to pay in a, in a socialized healthcare system just for information. So they don't, if you're in Great Britain, you can't necessarily go get a sentinel lymph node biopsy and have the National Health Service pay for it. But everywhere else in the world they do because of the value of that prognostic information. But there's indirect costs. You know, the patient takes time off work as they recover. Um, as we've talked, there's risks. It requires general anesthesia. You can't do it under straight local like you can the white excision. So. I, I don't want to subject a 92-year-old with four heart attacks to a general anesthesia they don't need where I could make their life worse rather than better with that information. Um, and as we talked, there is still a risk of lymphedema even with sentinel node biopsy. It's about 3 to 6%. So most people don't, thankfully. It's much less than taking them all up. But if you're the, you know, the one person in 50 that gets a chronically swollen arm after sentinel node biopsy, you don't care that everybody else did fine. So that's important to think about. And I think the final thing is, Nobody needs a sentinel node biopsy. It's, it's a test, it's information, but it's only valuable information if it's valuable to both the doctor and the patient, if it's gonna help guide care and help the person make decisions in their life and things like that. So this is really a cooperative decision and that drives patients crazy. They say to me like, well, what should I do? And I tell them, you have to decide, is this worth it to you? Is it worth you going under a, a general anesthesia procedure and a couple weeks of recovery to know this? Um, and the same goes for a completion node dissection. People are just saying, well, nobody needs them anymore. That's not true. If you have a young 20-year-old that maybe has two positive sentinel nodes, there's a high risk that there's other positive nodes there, and yet they still may have a low risk of distance spread, knowing about the rest of the nodes may actually be very valuable. At the same time, if somebody might say, I've got one positive sentinel node, I'm 70, I don't want to risk a lymphedema. You know, if, I, if I need this arm to you know, help me do my day-to-day -day activities, so it's really a discussion that the doctor and the patient have to have together as to what are we going to get from this, what kind of actionable information are we used to make a difference in terms of the prognosis and the patient's care. So.